Get it. Yes. Present. Here. Here. All right, Mr. Taylor. Oh, and also our city manager um, had an obligation today, and so we're going to um, keep her in our prayers, and, and thank you, Mr. Palin, for taking over today. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Palin. Not a problem. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, actually, uh, some bowels right here. Invitation. Right. Yeah. Let us pray. Gracious provider of all that you've done for us today, for the blessings of life, health, and strength, for the promise of your presence that continuously abides with each of us, Lord, we pray that our time together today may, might be spent in a very productive way, that conversation be of such that continues to expand our city, this wonderful city of ours, that it continues to grow and prosper. Bless us all. Be with our city manager. Lord, we pray that thou would bless and touch each one of us individually. We ask it in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Uh, first item for city council discussion is an update from the Central Midlands Regional Transit Authority, the Comet. Mr. John Ando, Executive Director and CEO. Welcome, John. Thank you for being here. I'm uh, John Ando. I'm the new Executive Director and CEO of the Comet, about 16 weeks new here in Columbia. And I just want to just give an uh, introduction of myself to the council and also just give an introduction of where the Comet is going and just get some comments and feedback. Uh, just so you're aware, I do have uh, 20 years experience in public transit management and came to the Comet from Dutchess County, New York, as I was previously there, former county transit administrator, so that's Poughkeepsie, New York. And then previously to that, I was with Capital Metro in Austin, Texas as the program manager of bus contracts and I oversaw uh, the contracted providers operating 450 buses. I'm going around to each of the member agencies of the Comet to introduce myself and discuss the direction that we're going. Um, as you're aware, the city appoints three members to our board of directors and provides to the Comet uh, through at least the Transit Center and the Assembly Street Bus Shelter, as well as the ability of us to install and maintain bus stops throughout the city. The city is served by 20 of our 38 bus routes and services, uh, so the city is a primary benefactory of the transit system. Um, and as part of those transit services we provide, we operate fixed route, um, reflex deviated fixed route where the bus actually goes off route in a zone and picks up people at their door, a DART ADA paratransit for those that have a disability that cannot ride regular fixed route buses, and then most recently the downtown circulator called the Soda Town Connection. Some of the things that we're going to be looking at over the next fiscal year to um, help uh, continue to improve the transit system and ensure that the member entities and the taxpayers are getting value from us includes the development of a new short-range transit plan and a comprehensive operations analysis. What we're going to end up doing is evaluate the performance of the common system and through community and stakeholder engagement look at reimagining the transit system and determine is the current transit network making sense for the for Richland and Lexington County. If it is, then we continue to enhance it. If it's not, how can we make it more efficient and effective so that more people within the two counties can continue to utilize our system? And normally transit agencies do this type of redesign and comprehensive operational analysis every 10 years. The last time we did this analysis was 2009, uh, prior to the penny implementation. We're also going to be working with um, the COG and SCDOT in doing a park and ride lot study to determine the need for express buses from some of the uh, further out points of our service area to downtown Columbia to allow those to access jobs and other employment opportunities. Um, one of the biggest things we're working on now is a transit center refresh. We want to change the perception of the transit center, um, ensure that it's only serving transit riders, make it more beautiful, um, 
includes landscaping, like trying to form partnerships with the city center partnership as it relates to additional yellow shirt ambassador support, um, putting up potted plants. Um, we're beefing up our security and I'm in discussions with the police department <coughs> about um, having off-duty officers also help patrol in that area. And then we also want to make the amenities inside favorable for our riders. I want to continue to engage the community and business partners regarding transit service design and um, continue to do community outreach and do and participate in community programs. Some of those programs include partnering with the library to possibly put books on buses to improve um, literacy for our people that utilize the transit system. We're working with a vend uh, a nonprofit called Safe Place, to where um, if youth are in trouble, they can come to a transit bus to get a safe place, and then we would link them to a crisis counselor for those who are in need. Um, we're working with uh, the bike share vendor to see how we can incorporate transit into the new bike share program. Possibly we can provide a contribution to expand the bike share network and add more bike share stations near transit stops, as well as um, provide a contribution so that transit users can actually um, take advantage of using the bike share program, especially those that live in the low income areas. We're also looking at our route network, ensuring that we're connecting the food deserts in the city limits, as well as in Richland County, to fresh food markets and trying to make it easier for the transit rider to get to grocery stores. And since there's, um, there's a growing uh, food desert uh, concern that's going on in our service area. We're gonna look at uh, redeveloping the soda cap connector service and I'm starting to engage with the downtown associations and the partnerships such as Vista Guild, Five Points Association, City Center, Partnership Experience Columbia to see how we can make the service robust and ensure that the service is meeting the needs of the downtown visitors and residents that uh, want to patronize downtown attractions. And then lastly, uh, we're going to uh, continue to improve the bus stops, bus shelters, and passenger amenities and continue to work to add more of those amenities throughout our service area to, take, to keep our passengers from having to wait in the uh, elements when it rains or when it's too hot. That really concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions about myself, the comments, or the direction that we're going, if there are any. So, um, yeah, Mr. Duvall. So, John, you mentioned the reconfiguration maybe of the soda cap. Do yes. you have anything particular in, in mind there? Or I'm very interested in keeping the soda cap available because I think if we can train people to start using that and give them other alternatives other than the soda cap, if they can just hop on and hop off, uh, we can increase our ridership. I'd agree. Um, one, making it faster to connect the downtown areas, so Vista, Five Points, Main Street, better, um, possibly including West Columbia into the mix, um, also including USC as well, and Allen, the Benedict University <coughs> areas. What we have is we have two routes that presently operate, primarily traveling down Gervais, but with them traveling down Gervais, it's almost out of sight, out of mind to the downtown, uh, people that are patronizing the downtown businesses. So how can we per pick a route alignment to ensure that people can see the buses, it's walkable, and it's easy to access. Um, possibly going on Main Street is a good example of, of achieving that. Or going in front of the convention center, going in front of USC, um, going down uh, some of the side streets in the Vista area so that um, it's, people aren't feeling like they're having to catch this bus on a major highway. That's a good example. And then also making sure it's running seven days a week with longer service hours during the times people are going out, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, for instance. And then we also just started a pilot Soda Cap Connector 3 connecting downtown via Main Street to the Spirit Communications Park for those to go to the Firefly Cave. So if we can link all those together, including the Bull Street neighborhood, I think we can get a robust downtown circulator here. Thank you. Mr. McDowell? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. John, thank you so much. Um, welcome to the city. Thank you. And uh, you got a handful of them. Yes. I know it. Let me ask you one or two questions I do want to ask. One, preferably about soda top, soda cap, <laughs> soda pop. <laughs> yeah, did you say it? Yeah, man. All right, soda cap. Yes, sir. Um, and the reason I'm asking this question, of course, I got a call yesterday. And I want to ask you how many soda cap? Buses or 
routing themselves through the city. And the call that I got was a Saturday. I had visitors on a corner of Main Street somewhere, I think. And uh, there was a, a real lag in time in terms of, uh, and the visitors, from what I understand, left. And uh, I have no idea. I think that, I think it was going down towards Rural Street, I think, if it goes that way. Um, yes, that's uh, Captain Eckert's. That's yes. correct. Um, they were trying to get the spirit communication. And um, for some reason or another, they stayed in an inordinate long time trying to get on the board. I want to ask that. Um, I certainly appreciate us looking at a reconfiguration, perhaps, of soda tap, soda top tap. Yeah. Let me just say Coke, and you know what I'm talking about. Exactly. <laughs> so to answer your first well, question. Let, 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 let me finish it, and then I'm done. Then I won't get tangled up with soda tap or Coca-Cola or whatever. Um, I, think what you, I think what you're planning to do is something I think, uh, because ridership right now for the, soda, for the soda tour is very, very important, especially for for visitors who are in our city, and they are utilizing that service. So I hope I hope that reconfiguration of things as it relates to soda, soda time. The other thing is Route 22. I understand that Route 22, you've expanded that some. Yes, so I'll ask the first question, then I'll go to 22. All right. So with the soda cap, uh, as it relates to the soda issue cap. on the Saturday, the service to the Spirit <coughs> Communication Park only operates when there's a Firefly game. And my, I don't think there was a Firefly game last Saturday. I think they just wanted to visit. They wanted to visit? Yeah. Okay. So we don't really... Okay. In order to get there, it would be on v Route 301. That's the closest it would get there on a normal Comet okay. service. But on, I believe, tonight, the Fireflies are playing and will be running that service. Okay, yes. good. Um, as it relates... And then they run a consistent 20-minute headway. So um, the buses should be going by those various soda caps and that's their bus stops okay. every 20 minutes. The service is split right now. It runs from 11 to 3 and then again from 5 to 9. Okay. Um, with the revision, we're going to look at having it consistently run all day long during the, the prime time. Okay. So people can constantly rely on a consistent level of service. Um, as it relates to the redesign, uh, we definitely want, I agree with you, that we do want to have this service to help engage the visitor's experience. My goal is to have each of the downtown organizations act as a uh, stakeholder as well as a champion for the service so that they're promoting it within their organization so that I can help improve the viability of the service. I know we initially outreached them in the past, but I don't feel like they've been taking an ownership of the service, and that's what we need them to do, kind of like what they do in Chattanooga with their electric shuttle. We can have those associations take ownership of the service and have the merchants pr uh, um, promote the service, I think the service will be very successful. Especially if it's hitting key front door destinations like Main Street, the Convention Good. Center, the museum, the Five Points Fountain, um, major attractions in the Vista, and even West Columbia and the Riverwalk. Um, as it relates to Route 22, um, the Board of Directors did authorize the reinstatement of Route 22. It is going to run seven days a week, every hour from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday and 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekends. It's going to connect the Rosewood Hills area via Harding, Five Points, uh, through the Bull Street uh, development and also going to Spirit Communications Park through the Colony. And um, that would actually give the Colony residents and people on Harding direct access to fresh food at like the Save-A-Lot Food Market, the Columbia Housing Authority, as well as the Food Line uh, down in Five Points. So that service just start by September. Good. Madam Chair, just yes. and I'm through. Yes, sir. Talk to, talk to us a little bit about the transition, transit center reset, and a little bit more specifics about what you're planning to do. I heard you say security, beautifying the area, um, which I think is admirable. Um, can you talk a little, just a, a minute or two about that? Sure. Um, the transit center, I know, has been a sore subject for many people in our community, riders, business community, the neighborhood. And um, 
there's two, th two things to the transit center. We have a short-term plan and a long-term plan. For the short term, we want to at least make it more an attractive area. We want to connect that block better with the Main Street District. We are within the boundaries of the BID. However, it just seems like you have Main Street here, and then you have the transit center here, and it just doesn't feel connected. So if we can make it connected so people feel comfortable to walk that direction, it can possibly help spur development in the future. So some of the things we're talking about doing is putting better landscaping, removing the weeds in the sidewalk and around the perimeter of the building, uh, painting the interiors better, putting um, uh, services inside, like um, having fresh food vendor inside to sell uh, fresh food items for transit riders, um, having customer service there to uh, answer questions, having our transit information available. Um, in addition to the security guards patrolling the transit center block, um, uh, paying the city to have off-duty police officers to be there during the peak times, um, contributing to the city center partnership so that we can have yellow shirt ambassadors uh, patrolling there more and providing that customer-friendly experience, taking advantage of some of those potted plants that the central, uh, central city center partnership provides to downtown businesses, and um, improving the fencing. The fencing is inconsistent and it looks out of dated, so making the fencing consistent throughout the entire bus stop zone, and then picking up um, any litter that's generated by transit riders, and then making sure that the environment is comfortable inside the transit center so that we can encourage our transit riders to start waiting inside the transit center versus congregating outside, creating kind of that perceptive loitering experience. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Davis. Um, Thank you. Um, sounds like you've been uh, assessing the system. I think that's, so far we're talking about um, a number of things that have been, I think, the root of a lot of the calls I've been getting. And a lot of it is systemic, so I think it's good that y'all are taking a look at that. Um, two quick things. One, um, Shelters. There's been um, uh, a number of attempts to provide and locate shelters throughout the system. Um, uh, where is the? Where are y'all on that? Really placing shelters for the riders, especially the elderly and uh, young mothers with children. That seems to be a challenge. We've budgeted federal dollars to cover installation of shelters. Um, we have a plan to at least install 11 to 20 shelters a year throughout the service area. Our biggest challenge has been getting right of way. However, um, we've, um, we're working with each of the jurisdictions, city, uh, Richland County, Lexington County, and SCDOT on our abilities to try and get um, right of way so that we can put up shelters. We did uh, find an ordinance that authorized uh, the RTA to construct bus amenities within the city right-of-way. Um, so we're trying to work through how we can take advantage of that ordinance that was adopted by council back in 2005 so we can get more amenities up sooner rather than later. But our biggest challenge has been getting easements from property owners to install the shelters. Okay, yeah, yeah that's, that's, I got one to just... Today, a picture, I won't tell you where it is, but it's, that's sometimes there's a challenge with storefronts and that sort of thing. So I'm hoping that we can, y'all can work that out. Uh, the other yeah, thing is- I just want to add one more thing too. I am looking at a, an alternative bus shelter design mm -hmm. that can almost be like a, like if you're walking down the sidewalk, okay. it could be like an overhang yeah. over the yeah. sidewalk. Right. And then instead of putting a bench, possibly people can stand underneath it so that if we can't Everybody get, benefits from that can't get the right-of-way, we yeah. can at least still give a basic mm -hmm. level of, of shape. Mm -hmm. um, working on something that stems from a call yesterday, uh, I'm just trying to see how we fit in with, with the, um, the RTAs. Um, trying to help a guy that uh, leaves here from Wilkes Road, for example, then it takes him to um, 
Sumter, Camden. Do we do we work with them in any way as far as pickups and uh, pickup points uh, or transfers, for example, from from maybe DART to our system to the RTAs? So the DART's part of the the RTA right. system. Um, DART's only for those that have a disability right. that cannot use right. the regular fixed route system. So there hasn't really been crossover between Comet Bus and DART Bus. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to be looking at doing some innovative things to help promote people that are utilizing DART to access the Comet system and even doing some zones in certain areas where we would combine the fixed route and the DART into one service, which we call Reflex. So it's basically a bus that will pick up general population, but it will also go off route and pick up those um, within a zone closer to their door so that then people don't necessarily have to walk to a bus stop. But in that zone, the Wilkes Road area, no, we don't, beyond the regular fixed route and the DART service, there's still two independent services. I'm, I'm going to refer them to, to, to your office. Uh, okay. I, I think the way we operate is good. But there's a there seems to be a, a void in there where, where there's a drop off for a person with disabilities and the next pickup by a dart. That's that's his problem. And so he's he's left uh, even out of county because of that for Oh, so is he possibly out. out of the zone? I, I don't know. So I don't I couldn't be too specific with him. But it sounds like we do have um, um, a process. We seem to have a system that, that kind of troubleshoots to yes. be more specific with, with riders. So I'm going to send him to y'all. Yeah, if you can give me his information, okay. we'll outreach to him and see what we yeah. can do to help him. Okay, thank you. And, and John, can you um, just expound upon, I know that you're working on several things regarding um, energy efficiency. Um, can you just briefly yes. talk to us about where you guys are on the planning with that and potentially uh, what resources you've, you're trying to tap into? Yes, so we've been doing electric bus demonstrations. Uh, we've demonstrated the Proterra electric bus back in <coughs> July, um, excuse me, in June. And then we did, uh, tested another bus called BYD or Build Your Dreams uh, last month. And actually, this week, we'll be testing a new flyer electric bus. And we've been running them on various routes throughout the system, Soda Cap Connector, and some of the downtown-oriented routes here in Columbia. And um, we've also pursued some grants uh, with the Federal Transit Administration to possibly buy a small fleet of electric buses to start replacing some of our diesel buses. So if we are successful in getting these electric buses, uh, we can start having a zero emission uh, fleet. We're also looking into, um, as it relates to the charging, if we can find a way to put solar panels on our buildings so that we can charge these electric buses through those solar panels and also possibly sell power to the grid, then we can have a true zero emissions <coughs> fleet because now the buses are being powered through, in essence, the sun through the charging. So that's some of the um, electric or the environmental initiatives that we're looking at at the mm -hmm. present time. And I encourage you guys, um, if you're interested, to check out the electric bus when it's in service starting on Thursday through next Thursday. Thank you. Anything else? Well, again, welcome to Columbia. We're glad to have you. Thank you very much. And um, um, if you could just, I think we say this all the time, um, I know last time as August was here, we, we stressed that um, we're, you've got an excellent community person Tiffany is everywhere, and she does everything. She does a great job for you guys. So I did want to say that to you, compliment you on, on her. Thank um, you. But we're a great resource. So, you know, when you're having stuff, make sure that we know so we can let it out through our means of community meetings and engaging. Um, you know, just I think in the past, um, the times that there's been issues, it's mainly been miscommunication and we can certainly help you make sure that uh, the community as a whole knows things. So please don't let this be, you know, the only time you come in front of us. Let us know what you need and keep us updated. We definitely can do that. And I can actually tell you that I'll be scheduling community listening sessions throughout the entire service area. 
so that we can just go to the writers and just listen and hear from people what, what they like, the good, the bad, and the ugly about the comment, and so that we can gather, put together a plan on how we're going to address those issues as a community. So is hopefully we'll like, start doing those in August and September. Is that like undercover calls? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. <laughs> It's just our way of making sure that the community can talk with us because I've heard from, I, I ride the bus myself. I live um, off of uh, Beltline and Covent. So I see some of the riders and the riders tell me that they, they perceive that we don't listen. So I want to change that perception and let them know that we do care, we do listen. It is their system and we want to design the system that works best for the community. That's great. That's great. Mr. Davis. Just one follow up question. Um, going back to the uh, <coughs> route designs, um, you mentioned some areas where you, um, you plan to kind of put a little more meat on those bones. But uh, how, how do y'all um, make the determinations of the, the actual stops along corridors? I think the corridors are okay, but there are clusters of neighborhoods, I, I think, and, and based on some conversations, could benefit more if there's, there were more routes uh, on some of the interior streets that, that kind of border clusters before they get to, to one of the major corridors. Have y'all thought about that? You know, normally service design is based off of need. So if we get a, a large number of people requesting the service, mm -hmm. then we look at how to provide that cluster or neighborhood with the appropriate level of service. Mm -hmm. As part of our service reimagining process, I would like us to look at the types of services that we're providing. Because transit is more than just the conventional bus. We can do innovative things like uh, microtransit, partnership with Uber and Lyft, partnerships with taxis, uh, bike share, van pools, uh, demand response dialer ride type services, um, volunteer transportation. So depending on the need, depending on how the neighborhood design is, I would like us to start getting creative on how we can provide them with some type of service that works best for them versus just trying to run a conventional bus. Right. And the reason I, I mentioned that, I think, you know, when you go back and you look at how Columbia was designed initially and set up and, and sort of evolved, uh, transportation for folks was, was critical. And you, and you notice when you grade certain streets in the city, you see... The, uh, the trolley tracks, mm -hmm. and those were, a lot of them were on the interior of the neighborhoods, even before they get to, uh, say, Maine and Gervais and places like that. So that's why I'm, it's just, it's just clicking. And, and those were the neighborhoods, too, that had the back, the alleyways. Mm -hmm. Folks had that convenience of the, the tr trolley up front and the garbage and track pickup and the milkman mm -hmm. in the back. It's kind of similar to some of yeah. the older urban cities in the country, mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah we, we, we definitely look at um, that as part of our service design. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks for having Thank me. You. Much appreciated. Thank you. Good afternoon. Item number two today is our health care update. It's Pamela Benjamin, Chief of Staff, Director of Human Resources. Thank you. information, make sure that we have, like, I know Earl would start right here. I know Earl would has one. Um, yeah, Brandy, Brandy Nakers usually has one. I don't see it on here. I thought I saw another previous one. one. <coughs> She's going to Forest Hill. She's going to Forest Hill. Yeah. I'm going to go to Forest Hills. Yeah, I'm over. I'm over. She is. Yeah, she asked. Plus, they have ice cream. I gotta think of stuff that my kids want. <laughs> yeah, I, I, w I went there last year, but yeah, starting at eight o'clock, I'm not making that. Day. Which one? St. Mark's Wood. Oh. That's Mr. Davis, huh? We lost Mr. Davis. We lost Mr. Davis. <laughs> Okay, so, Brandon.
raining, of course, it's not happening. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Everyone. So, I am here today to give um, another health care update. Um, I've passed out as many copies as I have, but of course, we will post the updated version um, on the um, on the website with the agenda and and so everybody will see that because I have added a few different slides since um, it was posted on Friday so just a few things I've added so as you all know we've been in a constant discussion about health care which is a very important topic um, for all of us here and so I wanted to give you all just an, another update based on some of the um, instructions you all gave us to look at some other options, some additional options. So as far as why, I turn it on, right? I always have to turn it on. Um, as you all know, the city has had the fortune to be self-insured for our health care benefits for over 30 years. Um, that has typically been a very beneficial strategy to manage health care costs. Um, and it's allowed us to have a lot of flexibility and provide a, a very rich benefit um, and some financial options for us as employers and, re and employees and retirees. But the trend has been that nationally, health care costs have increased significantly. Um, in addition to changes in health care, um, some of the, the requirements of the Affordable Care Act and changes in the governmental accounting reporting standards, um, the city really had to look at making some difficult decisions as far as providing health care benefits to our employees and our retirees. So um, health care claims, as you all know, were projected to grow to $32 million in FY18-19 and forecasted to grow 5 to 15% per year after that. And in addition, the city was facing an OPEB liability of between two to four times um, higher, and by fiscal year 2047, a liability of $1 billion dollars or to exceed $1 billion. So those growing health care costs, those uh, claims costs um, that increased liability had us really looking at a lot of options as we discussed in the last couple of months. So based on those factors, um, the ability to sustain our current health plan without significant reductions in the benefit or elimination of coverage um, and, the, and the potential and the Potential for both was imminent, so we had to kind of look at some other options. So the options that were explored, as you all are, are aware, um, to maintain our own self-insurance plan included um, premium increases, plan design changes, um, introduction of spousal surcharges for active employees and for retirees. We were considering complete change to the benefits, dropping spousal coverage, um, things like changing the eligibility and eliminating coverage for some retiree populations. We were even looking at um, whether or not we would be able to provide health care for our retirees, um, of our, for our future retiree, for our future hires, whether or not we would be able to provide them with retiree insurance. So based on all of those options, we had to give some, some consideration to the state health plan as being a viable option to allow us to continue to provide comparable insurance coverage to eligible active employees, retirees, and their dependents. So that sent us on the journey of looking at the state health plan, as you all um, requested of us, and as some of our um, employees and retirees had also suggested. So that I will say that that's something that we had considered previously. Um, but we really wanted to stay self-insured, and so we were trying to look at every option possible in order to maintain that form of health care administration here at the city. So it wasn't that we didn't consider the state health plan previously. We just really wanted to maintain those rich benefits and be able to maintain our self-insured status. So I say all that to get us where we are now. So with these considerations, of course, any transition there are things that are um, going to be different and things that have to be considered. I don't want to say pluses and minuses, but that's kind of what we have to look at when we make these big decisions. So um, these are in no order of importance or, or, um, or um, 
good or bad. They're just in order here, things to consider. Um, with the state health plan, it does offer us a similar network with comparable benefits. Blue Cross Blue Shield is the is the um, administrator for their health plan, was the administrator for our health plan, and so there will be similar networks and similar comparable benefits. Um, we looked at this as a recruiting and retention tool um, in the sense that some other people from other entities, such as other state agencies, um, other municipalities, other counties, they have the state health plan, and um, we certainly are trying to recruit the best and the brightest, and there are those employees who may say, well, I've been in the state health plan for a while. If I come to you all and you're self-insured, that will affect whether I have retiree insurance coverage or not. So they made a decision that they may not come to work for the City of Columbia because of that. So we may recruit and retain some um, employees or some potential candidates that may have been reluctant to come to us because of our health benefits because they would have to change from being a state health care um, plan participant. Um, it will offer us some potential savings for the city of Columbia. We always say potential because Jeff makes me put that word in there. So nobody thinks there are going to be some, you know, that there's going to be some huge windfall. But there definitely will be some savings um, in terms of administrative costs, in terms of claims that we won't have to pay now, that we had to pay, pay before. Um, but, you know, as we all know, when you talk about the cost of health care, it's a complicated formula when you, that you look at. So, so there, there will be some potential savings. Yes, ma'am. So Pam, can you explain when you said um, we, don't, we wouldn't have to pay claims that we had to pay before? Is that because it's a bigger pool, or is it because certain things aren't covered? That's a very good question that I, that I skipped over. Now we will be joining a group before <laughs> we were self-insured. And when you're self-insured, you're responsible for all the liability. All the claims, all the costs for administering the claims, you're totally responsible for it. If we join the state health plan, we will be part of that group. We will no longer be self-insured like we are. They're a self-insured group that we're becoming a member of. Does that make sense? No. Yeah, but really. I still don't know why that would save us. So, I mean, if... They will be paying the flat premium. Right. Okay, right. So, we, will be so paying, they, we will be paying them a flat amount. We play at that... A flat so amount you, no to matter what the claims are, exactly. or how much they cost. Exactly. Now, what will happen is because we're a new participant, um, after we're in it for a year, they will reevaluate what they charge us, and there may be an experience rate adjustment based on our claims activity. So they will be looking at the claims, but we won't have to pay the claims directly like we do now. So, Pam, the experience rate either then goes up or down. It will go up. So it's, it's at a baseline. The baseline is what we'll pay. And then if we have, you know, some really bad years, then they'll do an assessment of what our, what our experience rate is, and they will charge us According. A, a capped amount, 50% of whatever that is. So we looked, and, and that's, a, that's an important question. So we, me, Jeff, Missy, Jan, we, we looked at what – and, and say health plan, I, I, will, I forgot to introduce Matthew, Joseph, and Jennifer Dollar. They're from the state, from PEBA. They're from Phil Services, and so they're here to answer any questions you all may have in, in addition to, about the state health plan. But we had some extensive meetings with them, and they gave us some trends for um, entities that had joined them to look at the trend over a 10-year period. And so we could get an idea about what that trend would look like and what we would be considering. Um, it looked, you know, <coughs> some years no trend for some people. Some year it was, you know, around 4%. Um, it just depends on, on your claims activity as to what that, what that experience rate may be. But it, it still, with all the things considered, it still seemed to be a, a manageable amount compared to what we were doing before. So, but we did give that some consideration. The answer is probably no, but you guys certainly can chime in. I mean, we will. Our experience rate will be based on what we, what our experience is. Experience now we do have the benefit of being in the pool, but our experience rate will be calculated based on our, our experience, our claims.
cost the cost that you will be assigning to our group will be based on the cost for the whole team. had an incident, a medical incident in our plan now as a self-insurer, that incident cost $100,000. In that same incident, if it, we, we were in your pool, it only cost $80,000. You're going to be based, basing your analysis after a year on that $80,000 after we have been with you for a year rather than the $100,000 that we would hit, that would hit us if we were individually So the big group kind of sets the overall baseline that we have to pay as, 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 a, as a participant, participating entity. But then we may have to pay an additional percentage based on our individual claims activity that we experience. So we'll be both. So you get the benefit of the big group with the baseline, but then we'll be impacted by the amount of claims that we have. So it'll still be a percentage and it won't be actually paying the claim itself. And $100,000, that's a good claim. <laughs> Mr. Duvall, we have a million dollar claim. So, you know, but of course we have stop loss and all that is, you know, of course it's a complicated issue, but, but yeah. So um, when we talk about savings, we are looking at, you know, currently we have uh, several um, administrators that we pay administrative fees to our, our, our um, our TPA, our, our, our medical um, plan administrator, then there's our pharmacy plan administrator. Um, so we, we're paying some administrative costs to those to provide, to help us manage our benefits anyway. But we're certainly looking at having, um, without the instability of those claims costs, you know, the, the total amount of those claims costs, we're looking at potential savings going forward. Um, it continues the coverage for all populations, active employees, the dependents, pre-65 retirees and dependents, and post-65 retirees and dependents. Um, there will be some costs that we occur during the transition. So we want to be forthcoming with that because we will have um, what will be incurred claims that will not yet be processed. So if we do this, we'll go live with it in January of 2019. But say somebody went to the hospital December 31st of this year, we'll have to pay that claim in addition, in addition to the cost that, it, that, that um, Blue Cross Blue Shield will charge us to, to administer we'll, that. We'll claim. send out a memo in December. Please do not go to the doctor. Well, it, it, and it all depends on whether or not the, the provider, when the provider um, submits those claims. You know, we could, people could have a claim from D, from. July and the provider yeah, doesn't yeah. submit it until January 25th. Right. So we'll have to pay any of those incurred expenses through the transition. So um, that will be a cost that, that you'll see calculated in, in, in what our total um, health care cost will be when we present next year for the budget. You'll see how that's how that's yeah, just for inquiry purposes. When that happens and a claim is filed prior to the entrance into the program. What's the numbers? Are there numbers available in terms of when there is a transition to the larger group? What's the numbers that are available in terms of the number of folks, perhaps, who will file claims prior? 
by your feet the insertion of the uh, the larger plane. Well, we don't have the, the number I'm of individuals, saying, but yeah. I will say that um, we have um, gotten some information from Blue Cross Blue Shield, and we're they're projecting that we'll have two million dollars, um, two point one to two point three million dollars in claims, and then we'll have to pay a percentage for them to manage that those those claims. So we're looking about two and a half million dollars for those claims. Now, of course, that's that's an estimate. Because yeah. it could, could be, be very well none, or it yeah. could be more. Yeah. So that's an estimate. So it's hard to it's hard to say, but that's what they're projecting based on the data that they have. So this is, I, I want to make sure I answer the question about self insured. So because we're self insured, we we pay all the costs, all the claims, everything. Yeah. Now we'll be in a in a larger group, and we won't be paying those claims directly, but we'll have that experience. So everybody's paid on. I want to make so sure that's that not an know. additional cost. That's not an additional cost. The claim cost, and of course, is it in addition to the cost that would um, take place during when you when you when you're actually tra uh, transitioning? Uh, is it different, or is all one in the same? So there's it's, it's really going to be two costs. So the okay. the cost that's for what, for doing the transition, you that's know, one. potentially we would have had to. You know, we were going to have to pay those claims anyway, whether we paid them in the plan we're currently sure. in or in a different plan. So that, that doesn't change that. Um, there is a little bit different um, percentage that we're charged to manage those claims because we're no longer with them as a self-insured okay. entity. All right. But that's just one cost. And then we'll have to pay our cost going forward will be the cost the to the state health plan transition. in order to, um, okay. you know, be a member of their All plan. Right. So um, we will be locked in for four years, um, and so that's you know that that has its good things and not so great things. Um, um, so we will be um, not having to have quite this discussion again for another four years. And we'll certainly still talk about healthcare because it's always going to be something that's very important, but we won't have this same type of discussion. Um, we'll have less less flexibility in the plan that we're in for the four years. Meaning that if we decided we wanted to add pet insurance to our plan, okay. we wouldn't be able to because we have to offer the, the options that they provide. So I shouldn't have used pet insurance because actually that's an optional thing. We probably could add pet insurance if we wanted to. That actually um, but I, I should say if we wanted to provide someone with, um, you know, unlimited um, Botox, then we could add that to our plan. And that's not a good example either, because that's, oh, that's I can't think of anything that's good. So, but, but, Pam, um, but along those lines, and, and you're giving those examples, but for instance, the conversations that we continue to have regarding um, um, tobacco surcharge, if we wanted to change that. Thank you. Or That's those kind example. of things. What those we example. wouldn't be we wouldn't have those discussions. That would be based on whatever is in the state's plan. Absolutely. Thank right. you, Mr. Devine. That was a great I, example. I view it's a positive rather than a negative. Well, and, and again, it, it definitely we it, things are set. It, it could things be things are not. You know, but and I, and I don't know what the state plan provides, and we'll hear that. But it could be. But it also could be. You know, we we have. I think we've been trying to be pretty aggressive regarding health, you know, uh, wellness and things. I, I don't know if that's provided, and if it is, great. If it's not, you know, the directions that we've been talking about going, we might, sounds like we might be limited, or at least we'd go it, but it'd have to be optional versus some of the things that we've, we've entertained trying to do. So, I mean, it really kind of loses, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it somewhat it potential would be to lose some of the autonomy of the direction we wanted to go in if that's not part of the big plan. Is that accurate? Um, yeah. Yes, but we offer what we call evaluation for transition. And so there's going to be some conversation with that to make sure that we're obviously paying that premium that we want to pay for later. Um, we also want to evaluate some of the other things. So we have some
And they also have, um, if we were with the state health plan, we would we would be able to use rally as well that we use now. It'd be a different rally, but it would be some features available through that system as well. So they do have some wellness. But you're right. Um, the next bullet says we will lose some some benefit of being self insured. So we lose some of that flexibility. Um, individual. Oh yeah, like late enrollments. I mean, you know, we, um, you know, we we certainly have some flexibility. There's some things that, that we allow, some eligibility things that we can make some judgment calls on, those type things, and we won't be able to do that anymore, which is is not altogether a bad thing. Um, individual participants may see changes in their experience when you go from one carrier to another carrier. You may see some differences in your experience. What we have as a negotiated rate for a procedure, the state health plan may have a different negotiated rate for that procedure. So there may be some um, differences in what people pay, um, and it may be a little bit some differences in some of those benefits. So we just, I just say that to know that, you know, with everything in life, everybody's not going to be happy because everybody's not happy with anything. So there may be some people who have a, some experience um, switching over to the new plan. So I just want to make sure everybody knows that. And it, it is, you know, we've been ex extremely generous, like you said, Ms. Devine, and we provided a lot of benefits like, you know, unlimited chiropractic visits and things like that that we won't be able to do anymore. So there will be some, some less rich benefits that we provide. Still comparable, still very comparable, I think, but there will be less rich benefits. Um, and, and just another point to point out, we ha offer three plans right now. We offer a base, a core, and a buy-up plan. It'll be two plans when we go to state health plan. Um, it will be a standard plan and their savings plan. So that's just to point that out is something to, to be considered. So as we move forward, the state health plan offers a variety of coverages, and I'll, I'll show you a chart about that in a second, for employees, retirees, survivors, and their dependents. Um, the plan covers almost 500,000 people, and they have 709 entities that are um, participants, including all your state agencies, your school districts, a lot of your local subdivisions, including municipalities, counties, special purpose districts, and other organizations that are specified in the statute. And since 1985, the General Assembly has allowed um, local subs or people such as us to participate in the state health plan. Questions about that? Okay, so as, as Ms. Devine was talking about earlier, what do we have to provide or what do we have to participate in um, as a state health plan participant? So if you look on this page, and I need to take off that draft. Not to um, these are the things that we have to offer. All the participants in the state health plan have to offer these options, health, dental, Dental Plus, State Vision, Basic Life, which is a $3,000 life insurance policy, um, Optional Life, Dependent Life, Basic Long-Term Disability, Supplemental Long-Term Disability, Money Plus, which is their flex spending account, um, Vision Care Discount Program. So we have to offer all of those to our full-time employees. Some of those we, there's no cost associated with, um, but some of the, the ones that are optional, there's no cost that we have to pay. But we do have to pay a $3 um, administration cost for all of our members to participate in the plan. So those are, the, those are the, the, the ones that we have to offer for our full-time employees. For our retirees and their survivors, it's Health Dental, Dental Plus, State Vision Plan, Vision Care, Discount Program. And then for our COBRA yeah. participants, it's Health Dental, Dental Plus, State Vision Plan, Vision Care, Discount Program, and Money Plus. And the participant has the option of whether they, you know, whether they want to enroll in Dental Plus or not. Um, that's an option that's available for them. Whether they want to get um, supplemental long-term disability, that's an option. Whether they want to participate in Money Plus, who they cover under their health insurance, that's an option to them. So there still be those options of who they want to cover and, and which level of coverage they want to take. Um, as far as participating. But these, we're locked in. We have to provide these coverages to all of our full-time employees, our retirees, and their survivors, or our corporate participants. So again, that, that those things are, are standard for anybody that participates in the plan. 
So, how we're going to do this, how we're going to transition. To get started, we had to submit an application um, and, a, and a small fee to the state health insurance program in order for them to consider us as a participant. Um, we are certainly by statute a, a, a local subdivision that falls within their guidelines as to a, 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 a group that will be able to participate. It's, we're a municipality, so we check that box. Um, so we had to submit that application along with some of our enrollment, some of our um, population information for them to be able to evaluate. So the application had to be in 120 days before the date that the coverage will take effect. We're trying to shoot for a January 1 coverage date, and so we got that in already. But I'll tell you a little bit later what we need to do next. Um, once the decision to participate in the state health plan has been approved by council, um, then we'll become part of the state health benefits plan um, and the related group programs. Information will be sent to the active retirees and COBRA participants um, starting as soon as possible because the more I put September, because we'll talk about that in a minute, but the sooner we can get information out, the better. And we will be having an enrollment. And I put October just because I think that's what we're shooting for. But of course, dates are subject to us approving this and moving forward with it if this is the decision that we're making. Okay? Do the, does Tika do the uh, enrollments? Or y'all do the enrollments? So, and we'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in my next slide, actually. Mr. Duvall. So, when we talk about eligibility, um, all of our employees that are permanent city employees working at least 30 um, hours per week are eligible. There are some different eligibility cr criteria. Um, there are some employees who work flexible schedules who over an aggregate period of time, if they work at least 30 hours, we'll have to offer coverage to them. That's an ACA requirement. So there are some eligibility um, guidelines. But in general, all of our employees that are covered now will be covered when we go, when we move forward. Even our employees that have declined the coverage will be offered the coverage um, if they want to participate. Because we do have employees that may have declined the coverage because maybe their spouse works for the state health plan and they were on their coverage. So now they'll have to take our coverage because you have to have your own coverage. You can't be on the state health. Right. You can't be on both. So there will be some eligibility requirements, but we'll work through that. But in general, all the employees that we have covered now will be able to be covered under the state health plan. Just a question for that. Um, are we considered 30 hours a week? Yes. You, you all are eligible for our insurance. Let me say that. I know we are it's now, not, but I was just wondering. I just it's, it's really not about your, with you all, it's not about the number of hours you it's about the, your position that you hold, and that makes you eligible. Okay. Because well, I knew that under there. I just, you know, you have to ask the questions transferring. I didn't Absolutely. know if that would. So I've never heard it like, said thirty hours a week before. I knew we were eligible, mm -hmm. but are you eligible if you're not considered? Because we're not hourly employees. Right. So you all would be like the legislators, legislators, and um, other elected officials who would be eligible. I, just, I put that 30 you hours because that's a general rule for, yeah. for a regular permanent employee. Um, as far as retiree eligibility, and I put this on the slide. I added this because I felt like people needed to see this information. So um, in order to be eligible for retirement, you, you, the person has to retire from the employer that participates in the state insurance program, which would be us, the city. He's eligible to retire when he leaves employment and has a had his last five years of employment were served consecutively in a full-time permanent position with an employer that participates in the state insurance program. So any of our employees who've been with us five years and are, you know, because we're getting that question, well, if I'm ready to retire at the end of this year, will I be able to be on the state health plan? The answer is yes. As long as you've worked for us for those five consecutive years, which you would have had to work for us, or even longer than that to be eligible for our retiree health insurance. Because remember, you either have to be employed with us for 20 years, 25 or 28 years under our current plan. 
And with some of the options that we were proposing, we were adding an age requirement and some other eligibility requirements. So that, those are the guidelines. So a lot of people who are about to be retirement eligible, they've got their 25 years of service in, they will be eligible for the state health plan as long as they're eligible to retire and have had that five years. Same thing with our retirees. Yes, sir. Same thing with our retirees. So if we have some current retirees who are on our plan, they will automatically be eligible for the state health plan. There won't be any issue with them transitioning to the state health plan. So I want to make sure people were comfortable with that. So to, to, to ask that, so because we've still talked about different eligibility requirements regarding retirement, that the second one, the eligible to retire when they leave an when they leave employment. So if someone came in once, because we've changed it twice, it was 20 years, then we changed it to 25, then we've changed it to 28. Well, we changed it from 20 years to 25 or 28. 25 with fours, 28 with regular South Carolina retirement. Okay. So, so we've not changed it again. I thought we changed no, it. No, okay, we were so talking about changing okay. it again. So if we change it again and someone came in when it was 25 or 28, they have that 25, they, they leave us, and they've been here for five years, that makes them eligible. As long as they have that 25 or that 28, okay. then they would be eligible. And so, but then if we change it, it's, it's, it changes for the new people coming in. So let me be clear. We, this will be the retirement eligibility if we go to the state health plan. We won't have any flexibility with that. We have to go by their eligibility rules. Okay. So we, okay, that's, that will, yeah. that's ultimately. So we wouldn't we be able to change anything. Because again, right. remember, right. we're part of a plan now. So we're part of the rules that they set for the whole plan. So we wouldn't be able to say, like we did before, we're going to add 55 years old as a requirement for eligibility. We won't have that flexibility. We have to do the, the eligibility requirements that, that they have in place. So if you guys... And we'll t I have another slide to talk about that, but go ahead, oh, Mr. Sorry. Davis. No, 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 that's good. I, I'm glad you said that, Matt. Point of clarification. Um, explain your um, funding requirement. What does that mean? Um, they're not participating. Are you talking about their participation or their the it's, deductions per employee? He's talking about how much they get charged for premium. How much we share that with our retirees or not? How much we pay? How much the retiree pay? So okay. With us, for example, myself, I work for the state agency. So with the way funding rules are set in the legislation, when I retire, if I have my last five, then the retirement person that gives me a break, and then I have a certain amount of earned years of service within the state government, then my employer is required to continue to pay their portion of that. Okay. Now with you being a local subdivision, you can make your own funding rules that basically basically dictate how much the employer pays towards retirees. But that's an option for, yes, for the agency. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's an option for us because we're a local right. subdivision. Mm -hmm. It's not an option for state agencies, but it is an option for us because we're a local subdivision. Okay. Yeah, we would have that option. Okay. Um, so 
part of a big part of what we'll be working with Matt and Jennifer on if we make this transition is communicating this change to all of our retirees, all of our employees. Um, and so we'll be doing a lot of educating, a lot of sending out emails and messages. Um, hopefully, as many people as you've had come to our sessions where we talked about insurance, hopefully they'll come to the sessions where we talk about the state health plan because they need to know what's getting ready to happen and they need to be educated and informed. Well, be and a lot of what is it, going to be said, they, people does, does a great job of providing communication. They've got a lot of stuff on their website. I would encourage any retiree or current employee to go out and look at the people website, to look at the insurance program, because it is some extensive um, um, communication. But we, we certainly um, will hope people will be as invested in this as they were in some of our other discussions, because this is, yeah. this is what we do. They need to know how the plan works, how it's covered, all of that, because one of the things that will happen is my benefits managers, Connie and, and um, Caroline, will have to work with PIBA. So a lot of our communication will go you know, directly to PIBA and for some of those um, decisions and some of that information. It's no longer our plan, so it will be on their plan. So that's going to be important. We want to make sure that everybody has that information. I think it's a good question. Okay. 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 So we already kind of talked about, Matt, we talked about the funding and all that. So the premiums, um, when we transition to the state health plan, we no longer can um, change our premiums. And, and transitioning is, is really going to help us to try and kind of manage our costs and our OPEB liability. But it's going to be managed in a totally different way, as we've talked about before. We will have pay a set amount of money to the state health plan to be a participant. So we won't pay the claims. We won't have some of the, the administrative costs, like I've said before. So it's a totally different dynamic as to how we're managing those benefits and those costs. Um, active employee premiums are set by PIBA. But like, like Matt said, the retiree premiums can be determined by our local subdivision, how much we share the love with our retirees. Um, so we have the option to, to, to pass all that cost off or a percentage or, or what have you. So, I mean, just, just to be clear on that and to Howard's point before about some things being good, I mean, the reality is the reason sometimes we go through all this really isn't because of our active. Our actives don't come up and say, you know, we don't like the premium, da da da, da. You know, they should, probably should be more engaged, but they're not who we – always hear from are the retirees and so with that point that doesn't save us from those meetings because if there is a decision of this council to you know to ask or mandate that the retirees pay more of their premiums or or something else that still is going to be a call that we make is that correct that's correct so every year we will be looking at that um because Based on the experience rate, you all might want to make an adjustment. You know, we'll have to see. We, we definitely will still be talking about the cost um, as we move forward. We, we, based on the trend, we don't anticipate there being, you know, but who, but I don't know. Lord knows I don't have a magic right. ball, crystal ball, and I, I can't predict that. So I guess, uh, and again, I'm not saying this is bad. I just want to make sure we have all the right information. So we potentially be could be could potentially be in a situation where we really have no autonomy on plan design and other things that we've done in the past to, to change premiums or cost, but we but we whatever the cost is, whatever the premium is, is going to be done. Not and we don't have any decision making ability in that, but we will have to say whether or not we're going to pay. A defined benefit of a defined amount of that, we're passing it all to the retirees. Whatever is that? What pretty much? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we'll we're gonna. I'm gonna. I got a few more slides to talk about that a little bit. So what we are recommending is that the city cover the funded rate for the pre 65s, um, just like the funded employees. Um, as you all know, we we said we had a DDB, but we haven't honored our DDB. We paid more than we were supposed to pay forever. 
So this sets it where the retirees, which we which we've traditionally done, we have had our retirees premiums be the same as our active premiums, and so that's that's what we're suggesting when we go to state health plan. Is that the, the pre sixty five retirees premiums reflect the employees premiums? I mean, I'll show you that in a second, and that we continue for the post sixty fives to provide some assistance to them as well with those premiums. Let me show you what those premiums look like. So if you look at a comparison of premiums on the next page, um, remember on the city of Columbia side, we had shown you some numbers about some plan design changes, some increases in premiums, and some increases in um, co-pays, deductibles, co-insurances. So I wanted to make sure that we were clear on that, because remember you all passed a motion that we were gonna share that, start going towards that 80-20 spread. So that's what our premiums would look like in 2019. So I felt that that was the best comparison to show you. These are the 2019 premiums for PIBA because their premiums for the, for the employee have not increased. So that's what those premiums look like. These are monthly premiums. And then those are what the City of Columbia premiums were projected to be for 2019. Can I ask, what's the, it's a huge difference between the standard and the savings. Why, why is it such a... The savings is a how deductible plan. Um, so it's sim not the similar to that our are, similar to our base plan. So it's not the coverage that's different. It's the deductible. Right. Okay. Right. It's the cover the deductibles, the co-insurances, um, the co-pays, and you'll see down on that chart a little bit lower. You'll see. Oh, I see. A little the, oh, bit of yeah, that. that's a huge difference. So that reflects that difference. Because they don't charge with that, it's um, generic, preferred, and and non-preferred, $9, $38, or $63. With the savings plan, you would pay 20% of the cost of that prescription, and the plan would pay 80%. So if that prescription was $300, you pay 20% of $300. You wouldn't pay $63. You'd pay 20% of whatever that $300 is. So the savings plan is really, and we'll, we'll hold, hold we We'll make sure that they do a lot of education for people on that <clears throat> because the savings plan the high deductible plan is for people who are relatively well and manage their money very well and have $3,600 exactly yeah. now there is a um uh, HR, uh, a health savings account that's attached to it that they can put money in so they can anticipate these increased costs but if somebody looks at the premium, as you can see, it's nine dollars and seventy cents. It's seventy-seven forty. It's so they may get a little fooled by the, pro, the, yeah, the right. that is cheap. The cheap cheaper means that the benefits are different. So we'll hopefully do a lot of communication with people on that because we call we say we have a high deductible plan, our core plan, but it's not. It's not. It's not well, by definition. So most of our employees are either on our buy-up plan or our core plan. I mean, I was, I'm, I'm in our base plan. We, that was our attempt at a high deductible plan was our base plan. Most of our employees are on our, either our buy-up plan or our core plan. So the buy-up, the standard is, is between our buy-up and our core plan. So we're anticipating most of our employees will go to the standard plan but well, we want to make sure that those people who think, well, I was on the base, so I'll go to the savings, that they understand there's a difference <coughs> between those two plans. So that's just kind of a summary. Again, um, that's, that's what the plans look like at a glance, just to kind of give everybody some comparison. Um, so you can see what the deductibles look like on their plans, the co-insurance, the co-insurance max. And again, like I said before, those were proposed for 2019. Those aren't our current, but those were the proposed changes in order for us to deal with our liability issues that we had. Pam, go back and tell me again, um, on the buy-up core and base, which one is standard and which one is savings? So their up. standard plan is, is, is kind of in between our buy-up and our core plan. It's not as good as our, as our buy-up plan because we've, we've got an extremely rich plan. But it, it is, it's a good plan. It's a very comparable plan. But it's between the buy-up and the core. 
And then the base and the savings are more alike in terms of, you know, the, the what the plan play plan pays for our employees. Does that answer that question? Switch it again. I know it didn't. It didn't. It didn't, it didn't say. Didn't copy to this. Well, I said that like five times. Okay, so the deductibles are switched. If you would write yeah, in, and I'll fix that. this. Okay. It is. It. I, Jeff's watched me change it. Yes, she did. I changed it five times. I don't know why I didn't say. So the deductible for the buy up would be a thousand. The deductible for the base is twenty five hundred. That got switched. We'll make sure it's right in the final presentation. I've changed it five times. I swear I did. Okay. So, again, those were the proposed plans. And I put on here premiums are estimates and subject to change because, Laura, if it's a penny off or something, y'all don't. It may be different. But we'll make sure we communicate it extensively to everybody so everybody knows what the new premiums will be. Okay. So when we look at the retiree rates, these are the proposed premiums for retirees. Again, these are monthly premiums. These are proposed, again, based on what the active employees are paying for our pre-65. You'll see that they should be the same amounts. Okay? You all will remember that we had not determined whether or not we were going to do premium increases for our retirees because we had not made a lot of those decisions, whether we were going to put have an HRA, whether we were going to drop people from coverage, we hadn't made those decisions, so we hadn't made any premium decisions, but I guarantee you that either the changes or the amount that we were going to be charged was going to be significant, so I can kind of guarantee you that that was going to happen. The post-65s, it's a, it's a Medicare supplement, and you'll see our plans over there. We have a, a senior supplement and an RX plan, so they had to get both. Now it'll be just one Medicare supplement. And, the, and again, the, the pre-65 is up to us. Pre and post-65 is up to us what we charge for those premiums. But those are our recommendations. And I don't know if you want Mr. Money over here to give you any, have, have any questions about how those, um, what, you know, any about, anything about the numbers. But he calculated it based on, you know, looking at what we would have to pay, our trends, reviewing all of that information. And this, this makes it sustainable for us now. You know, today is what, what's today? August 7th. 2018. So that's this is this is our proposal. Just about all of the premiums would be less expensive for the employee. But when you're talking about the retirees, the retirees are going to be able to continue on this plan, where we were looking at some severe cutbacks and decisions that would have eliminated some of the retirees altogether, especially the spouse. From our, our plan, but this this is this is as you just said, Pam, a sustainable decision rather than one that we would have to fight each year. Right, it's sustainable today. It, you know, I who knows what's exactly. going to happen next year. And so then we I, just have to know what we're doing. And right. and I actually do think it's good. But like I'm sitting here, I was thinking cause Sam and Howard were talking about the state plan. But I I, I remember very distinctly one of the conversations we had. We have. Um, we had a, a retiree, I won't say the position that the person held, who came in front of us and basically now works for the state and told us they don't do the state's health plan, they stayed on ours because it was better. So, I mean, you still will have folks who you are not going to be happy or not going to be satisfied, even though it's been proposed, people were saying, look at this. The reality is, as, as Pam has said, and we've always known, our plan is very rich. I, mean, I think the state plan is is good. It's still good, but still, when people are accustomed to a certain level, 
of access and, and care, they're not going to like any kind of change. And so although they won certain things, we, we just have to be, I just, we have to be very clear in what is doing and be prepared to deal with any discussion or opposition. And most importantly, when it comes to that defined benefit, we still, we're making changes that really, I think, benefit out of everybody, benefits the retirees more than anybody else. Um, and, and if we're doing that and then still they don't pay their full share, that, that's not fair to everyone else. And that's one of the trade-offs. But I did want to ask some questions on the next steps, uh, really the two and three. So, um, well, not really two. I, I know my position on two. Well, two and three. So, two, what, what would, why is that a question? And is there something that switching over um, causes us to feel like that that would be a discussion. And then number three, most importantly, um, the switch, um, what would, what is the mindset behind um, potentially closing the health center? Um, and if, or if we modified it, what, what do you mean by modify? Okay, good. That's a good segue to the next slide. So um, if you all were to make this decision, we would need you to vote on it um, at the next meeting in order to say we were going to accept the um, participate with the state health plan. The two and three, right now we have our wellness incentive program where people get $25, active employees and their spouse get $25 for um, doing certain, um, $75. Why did I say 25? It just came out just like, just like it was the truth. $75 for um, activities um, up to um, $225 per, per person. So if we were to go to the state health plan, that, that's currently managed by Blue Cross Blue Shield. Because we're self-insured, they manage that for us. So we would either have to look at finding another um, administrator for that program um, or not having that program at all. Because right now it's part of the administration that Blue Cross Blue Shield does for our entire plan. So we'd have to go out and find another administrator for the plan. Does the state have any kind of comparable wellness initiatives or incentives? Not in the same manner where they give actual dollars for, the, for doing the activities as we do. Now, they do have certain wellness um, incentive programs and, and certain things that, that they do, but it's not in the form of cash dollars that we provide to a person for going to get their teeth clean or going for their wellness visit. Um, it do, it's not the, that same type of a plan. Um, I will say that we, last year, I think only 10% of our population participated in it. So we're talking about 200 people. So it would be a decision to make of whether or not it's worth hiring an administrator and going through all the administrative costs for something that a, only a, three people in the room do. So, I mean, I do it, but I can't tell you how many people don't have never heard of it, no matter how much we yeah. try to communicate <laughs> with it. And they don't do it. So um, it would be a decision we have to make. Um, we can certainly explore other um, third-party entities that could manage that for us, but we would have to get somebody to manage that for us. I personally don't know that it's worth it when we have such a low percentage of people who participate in it in the first place. So it's certainly a loss for those of us who do it, but most people don't. So. On our... Um Health Center, do, do we get our fire and police physical and mental health information? Yeah, our, 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 our pre employments, our fire physicals, um, the police are, are starting to do some, some um, fit for duty physicals there. Um, just visits that our employees can go there free of charge. The reason why we might have to close it or modify it is because, again, that's Blue Cross Blue Shield, with our relationship with them, and UCI Medical, who runs Doctors Care, we were being invoiced and managing that all together. As you all would see in those budget documents I give you, there's a separate cost for managing the health center. So we'd have to figure out a new method, a new model for managing the health center. We may still be able to continue to do it. I'm not saying we won't, but we're going to have to explore how we do that 
Because right now, those claims just go through Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's zero, zero co-pays. There's nothing. So once we separate and we become a member of the state health plan, we no longer have that type of connectivity. Sam, with what are you? United, I mean, with um, UCI. What, 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 I thought we already, uh, I thought we were switching anyway. Well, you know, we did, we did that, um, that um, RFP and we, right. but we ended up not switching to Marathon. He was the one that he did that contract. So we would have to, we, we didn't switch. We stayed with um, Blue Cross Blue Shield and UCI Medical, mostly because of cost. It's going to cost us a lot to go to Marathon. And at the time, we couldn't afford to make that switch um, because it was going to mean doing a, having a totally different model, paying for some technology and a whole lot of other things that were going to make the cost go up considerably. If, so we didn't make that change. Actually. If we kept it. You're saying if we kept it? When we, I think it was, two, was it two years ago or three years ago that we did an RFP and we considered going, switching to Marathon Health um, Care to, to manage. Yeah, I remember us holding up and I thought the conversation was, some members of council would go check out Lexington because Marathon was doing there, and at the conversation I thought came back from we were impressed with what happened at Lexington and we were going to transition. But then I know that stuff happened. Never mind. So our okay. cost, we our, didn't our go. cost okay. analysis <laughs> says it's not. But what happened? It's not financially. Well, well no, Mr. Davis. We what we what we haven't <clears throat> done is right now. It was just they were their organizations were tied together. So it's an easy relationship. Right. Once we're no longer self-insured, right. it's going to change that dynamic. Right. So we have not met with UCI Medical yet. We've reached out to them to say, you know, if we sever, let's talk about, mm. you know, what that'll look like. So we still have the opportunity okay. to either do that and, and see how much that would cost us. And then we can bring back to you all whether or not the cost and the the how we would manage that center, and then we you all can make a decision I'm, whether or not you want to do it or not. I'm trying to remember the, the, the total conversation on that, but you uh, a few minutes ago indicated or alluded to the fact that um, there's not doesn't appear to be a great demand for the service. For that's for the that's wellness the incentive use. program. That's for the wellness incentive program. For the so, for the health center, I mean, we, we do have quite a volume of employees okay. that go through. It's a great benefit. Um, again, we do our firefighter physicals through there. We'd have to contract with somebody else to do that separately. Um, and so I, I do think that there are some benefits to having the employee health center. But yeah. we, we may have to take a look at what we do, how we provide it, right. whether people have to pay co-pays. Right, right now it's free. They may have to pay a copay. I don't know. Um, we, we, we didn't get, we wanted to stay away from charging and dealing with money and all that kind of stuff that comes along with that business expense. If we took credit cards and if we took money and, you know, all of that. So it was an easy thing to do it as a free health center. And so we, we would have to look at that. And Jeff, and I know you can't say it was all of them, potential savings. Is there, would there not be any, uh, value at looking at the savings that we might have with switching to investing that into all of our wellness initiatives, whether it is keeping the employee wellness center, whether it's doing some other things. Because I do think I think it, it's taken a while to get off the ground, and I don't think that it's utilized really to the level where it could be. But it's starting to utilize a lot more and more more folks who go like it. I, I enjoy it, and I think that we're able to. <coughs> Um, it, it's a huge benefit, I think, to the employees who use it, and I would hate to see us have come this far and then close it. That's my, I would concern. That's my concern. <clears throat> Those persons who are currently enjoying the benefits of a health initiative center, mm -hmm. um, particular, particularly for those concerns like diabetes and uh, cardio problems and the follow-up to that, some of those things. It would certainly it would certainly be of interest to me to see where that ball would bounce, whether it bounces in a way where we issue it to a third party or we do something else. 
those yeah. persons who are, some of those persons sort of depend upon that wellness check, that wellness back door. Well, now I, I don't want us to to, to to I don't want us to to not remember that the state health plan has a lot of mm-hmm. you know chronic disease management. They have some of the same things that Blue Cross Blue Shield is offering us now. With, with some of those, and they have, they, they are, that's important to them as well. The wellness checkups and those types of things. It just looks different. It'll be, it'll be different under their plan than it is under ours. All right, that's fine. That's fine. And that's fine. Yeah, but we, we do, it, it's a great benefit. Like Miss like Ms. Devine said, I take, I go, I take my children. Um, I love this, our employee health center. I think it's a wonderful benefit. And we certainly want to keep the benefit if we can figure out the logistics and technically how to do it and then how to afford it, we certainly want to do that. And we, we want to do the wellness incentive program. It's just weighing whether or not the cost of keeping these things is going to be beneficial or not. We don't want to stop the process of determining whether we will go into the state health plan with making those decisions. And so we can do those sure. decisions at a later date when sure. we need to go ahead and vote. Gotcha. In order to start a process of educating and moving this ball forward, right? We're, we're getting later forward. in the year, and so we want to make sure we go ahead and do that, and, and we will continue to evaluate whether or not that this, the wellness incentive and this, the employee health center is something we can do. We want to keep it because we it's a great benefit. It's just how do we keep it, and how can we and can we afford to keep it? Is what right. questions that have to be right. answered. But that's the next step down yes, the road. Mm-hmm. That's the next step, it, and it's an immediate okay. next step. I mean, we're we're already talking about because we would want to make that change close to the first of the year as well, if we could to kind of do it all together. But immediately, we need to vote on it. Well, in at the August fourteenth meeting, yes, sir. <laughs> we need to, we need to make a decision about it and right. vote on it. And again, I, you all have some have had some great questions and definitely things that we have talked about and considered. Um, and we wanted to make sure that you all understood, you know, all the facts, all the information to help you determine what your vote will be um, when you decide. I just want to make sure that when we do that on the 14th, that there's a parameter beyond the vote that's going to look at wellness care and that sort of thing. Because if that's going to be an, elong- an elongated conversation, I certainly would welcome. So we'll always in the state health plan. They always encourage their their participating employers to do those things from their perspective in their organizations to help with wellness because it helps them too. The healthier our people are and the lower the claims are, it helps everybody. So any of this stuff that we can do to continue to to, to do some of that well those wellness things and paying attention to our, some of our chronic diseases and helping our people become. Um, you know, healthier, we're still going to continue to do those things. All right. Yeah, definitely. Good. Does anybody have any more questions, comments? We're, I'm going to update that presentation, that doggone chart, one more time. <coughs> so I, t- I need to, oh. I'll have to turn it over to you because typically that's, that's not. Yes, ma'am, that's fine. Come to the podium so that we can get that on recording. I would just say as she's coming forward, Pam, um, I think it would be helpful just because we're kind of talking abstract, um, but um, between now and the 14th, I think we most of us know where we're going to end up, but we'd like to see the, the details of the benefits, like what does the state health plan provide um, and what we currently plot and where there might be some differences, like so that we are very clear on what might be, quote, lost or gained from the transition. Yes, ma'am. Hey, um, I'm Investigator Mostella for those of you that don't know me, but I just want to say thank you for probably, I can say that for myself and most of us active and retired employees. We've been fighting for this for years, and this is pretty good, and this is, I think, what we want. So I just want to say thank you. Thank and you. I, do, I do have a few eligibility questions, in case um, I know that those are not quite an answer, but I do want to say thank you. I think this is the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions for Ms. Benjamin or the representatives from Eba? And again, this is the start. I, I do thank them for last minute coming. Um, this is certainly the start of us communicating. If this is what we do, 
we will have lots of sessions. So I would encourage, like I said before, I hope as many people come to those sessions as has come to some of our meetings we've had because this is very important. And typically people don't pay attention to their benefits. And then when something happens, they'll be knocking on your door to say, I didn't know, and this is different. And so we want to make sure that we do a lot of outreach to help people know what, what's going to happen because that's important. Yeah, I'd echo that, and as I stated before, the the reality is every time we have these conversations, we typically get a lot of retirees um, who come, but our active employees, you know, and I know where you meet during the day, and they're working, and that's great, but we've got to figure out a way to make sure that they understand and engage, because I do think that there will be some differences, and people won't realize it until they go to the doctor and realize something's not covered or they change, you know, they change something and they, it's different. So we just need to make sure that um, we have a responsibility to our retirees, we have a responsibility to our current employees, um, and we need to make sure that they're engaged and they know what's happening. And we definitely will, will do our best to be, you know, at their locations, having meetings and times that are convenient for them, you know, have as many people you know, have sitting down with them as possible because we really want people to really understand benefits in general and then understand what these new benefits will look like. So that's that's important to us as well. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you, Ms. Benjamin. Thank you. I know it's not on the agenda, but I guess before we leave, what I thought, because we all have this, um, um, if you haven't already, I guess we all need to get Shanique and, and PR where we're going this evening. But just looking at this list, I just see a couple, and I know Howard saw one. Um, I don't see Earlwood on here. Yeah. Um, Earlwood is having a social um, beginning at 6 at Earlwood Park. And then I see down here, this is Forest Hills says 6 to 8. It's actually the email I have says 7 to 8.30. That was, I think, those are two corrections that jumped out at me. Howard, you had had something too. Uh, Gilbert Heights is meeting from six to eight at the Lavinis home on over that little cut through this. What is that? I don't know the name of the street. Cut through. Yeah. yeah. Is that Kilburn Heights? Kilburn Heights. All right. Does anybody else see anything? No. Earlwood was the only one I saw. Oh. Okay. Well, if there's nothing farther, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. It's been second. moved in second. <laughs> and all in favor? Well, no. Let's let the reader roll. <laughs> Mr. McDowell. Yes. Mr. Duvall. Aye. 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 Aye.